Hello, travelers. Welcome to Reach the World's Explorer program. For over 20 years, Reach the World has inspired youth to become curious, confident, and compassionate global citizens through virtual exchange. My name is Tim, and I'm so glad you're joining us for today's live stream event. Today, we're talking with wildlife biologist Charlie Placier. Charlie specializes in Eastern gray kangaroos, and once a year, he travels from his home in Montreal, Canada, all the way to Wilson's Promontory National Park in southeastern Australia to study these amazing animals in their natural habitat. I'm excited to meet Charlie, especially because today's call is just the beginning of his Reach the World virtual exchange expedition. Through written articles and video calls like this, we will be following Charlie's expedition for the next six weeks or so. You can find a complete listing of upcoming events, great at-home learning resources, and much more on our website at home.reachtheworld.org. And we'll also add the direct link to Charlie's virtual exchange expedition in the chat bar, most likely on the right-hand side of your screen right now. I wanna also welcome the teachers and students who are joining us live today. So excited to have you here to meet Charlie and hear about his work. Please feel free to use the YouTube chat bar to let us know you're here, where you're joining from, and of course, to share any questions you have for Charlie as we go. He's gonna start by telling us all about himself and then we'll get into questions and answers in the end of it, this about 45 minute call. So with that out of the way, it's time to join the expedition. Charlie, welcome to Reach the World. Thank you, Tim. Really appreciate the introduction. Uh, every fact was on point, so I'm very happy about that too. Uh, so hi, everyone, uh, teachers, students. I'm really happy to be able to talk to you today. Uh, I wish I could get your questions live, but I'm sure I'll be able to answer many of your questions uh, with Tim's help. And also, there's many questions I know I will get for sure that you might be too shy to ask. I'll make sure I answer as well. So let me start by sharing my screen. Um, so, so to make sure you can see what I am seeing. Uh, Tim, can you confirm that you can see my PowerPoint presentation? Looks great. Super, perfect. So welcome to my regional world presentation. Uh, as Tim mentioned, I am a, sort, of, sort of a rookie in the regional world process. Uh, it's my first presentation. So uh, you are my guinea pigs. I'll be trying out this presentation with you and I hope you'll be enjoying the latter. So as uh, Tim said, I'm Charlie Plazier. I am from Montreal, Canada, uh, home where I grew up. And uh, of course, I can, as you can hear from my accent, I speak French. Uh, I'm from Quebec, which is a French speaking province in Canada. Uh, and I am studying kangaroos. And this, I'm sure, raises many, many, many questions in your head. How does a French Canadian study kangaroos? That's a great question because we do not have kangaroos in Quebec, if you are wondering. So, to talk a little bit about me, um, that's a picture of me on the field, but before we get to the field, we'll stay in Montreal, Canada, because that's where I spent most of my life uh, before flying to Australia. And uh, I um, was a, a good student at school. I was always someone who was interested in learning, thinking I would do a great job later on, just like many of you do, I'm sure. Uh, but working as a biologist or an ecologist was never something I really thought of doing, because uh, I grew up in a pretty traditional family where sports was a big thing. My main concern when I was a kid was to play ice hockey. Every day I would be on the ice uh, trying to get better to hopefully one day play in the National Hockey League. That was my dream. That was my objective. And I did everything on that end to make sure I could reach that objective. Um, things happen in life sometimes that you don't really make it to one of your objectives, but that doesn't matter because it opens so many doors to me. I have spent my first uh, few years of hockey to play in Laval, Quebec, where I grew up. And after that, I started moving with hockey. Basically, I did two years of high school in the United States, in New Hampshire, in a really good prep school where I learned so many good things. I met so many great people. And that helped me actually build the individual I am today. And I'm really happy about that. So despite not being a professional hockey player today, I'm so happy that this sport brought me so much and brought me to amazing places around the world. Hockey brought me to places like New Zealand, uh, Czech Republic, Switzerland, of course, the United States, Canada, um, uh, Slovakia, and uh, many other places also that were not really dictated by hockey, but just were led by these choices I made based on my sport. And um, after my second year of university, when I was at Concordia University, which is in Montreal, Canada, uh, after my second year, I stopped playing hockey for some, for personal reasons, but I got interested in something else. 
uh, that same year I saw playing, I actually participated in a trip to the Galapagos Islands, which was an amazing opportunity for me to explore the biological world for the first time in a pretty specific context. Because if you don't know about the Galapagos Islands, if you don't know about the Galapagos Islands, uh, that's where Charles Darwin, uh, one of the founding fathers of ev the evolution theory, made all these theories about the Darwin finches. And he had many also many hypotheses based on the giant tortoise we could see there, the marine iguanas we could see there. So many amazing species that we were able to, to look at and experience firsthand. So that's probably the first time I was very, very excited about ecology in my life. And that was second year of university. And now if we fast forward a few years later, I am right here in Australia, in the Wilson's Promontory National Park, posing next to our field work uh, pickup truck. And that was prior to making an educational video. So don't worry, I don't just take pictures of myself for fun everywhere. But um, actually that's a beautiful picture because we can actually see how green everything is around me because that's in the springtime in the Wilson's Promontory National Park. And springtime for the Australians happens about in September up to early December. So the seasons are pretty much uh, rever reversed compared to what we have here in North America. And uh, now to talk a bit more about the Wilson's Promontory National Park. It's an amazing place where I was able to do my field work and work on a population of Eastern Greek kangaroos, but we'll get to that a little bit later. So tell you a bit more about the Wilson's Promontory National Park, which is where I spent most of my time. And I'm sure you're gonna ask me many questions about that later on, but this is what it looks like from a high up point. Um, that was during a hike when we were on the Wilson's Promontory National Park and we were able to see the Bass Strait, which is a waterway that is um, all the way down south of Australia. Actually, from there, this point, we could almost see the southernmost point of Australia, which is something pretty amazing for us because being so from so far away and being able to see such an iconic place in the world was really a, a lucky aspect for us. Um, and if you look at this picture as well, that is right next to our field station. So the Wilson's Promontory National Park was also a great place for camping. So there was many tourists uh, that would go on the camping site and, and spend some time to go on hikes and look at the wildlife, explore the fauna, the flora, and also spend lots of time on the beach as well, because not only there's lots of grasslands in the Wilson's Promontory National Park, but there's also lots of beaches and lots of sand dunes. It's a very uh, heterogeneous climate and they have many different types of climates basically in this area, which is something pretty amazing for, um, from the, again, for North Americans to explore. So now let me backtrack a little bit. This is a picture of Eastern Great Kangaroos. And now I'm sure you're wondering, well, he's talking uh, to us about all these topics about the National Park where he does his work. He talked to us about hockey, but how does a hockey player actually make it to Australia and study kangaroos? Well, that's a great question. I actually still ask myself at times because when you're, when you're studying a subject, you don't really know what's gonna bring you to a study species. As an example, I was doing a, a major in biology during my undergrad. And I was thinking, I would like to study something about evolution. And the following year, I got involved with a professor. He, told, he, he had some work for me to do. And I ended up working on a species I did not know about. It was convict cichlids, a type of small fish. And the question was not really why convict cichlids, but it was rather what can we answer using convict cichlids? And the, 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 the answer to that question was pretty, pretty much that my professor was interested in behavior, in neophobia as an example. And neophobia is pretty much when an, an animal is scared of a new stimulus, of a new thing that appears in their environment. And so my first experience working um, in ecology was actually not with a large mammal, not with a deer or kangaroo or anything, it was with a fish. And that's actually the first time I really got interested in doing research. So all this to say that kangaroos is pretty much the same thing. I was not necessarily thinking about working on kangaroos, but I was rather trying to work on a subject that was interesting to me, which was evolution of large mammals. So how did I decide to work on kangaroos? It was pretty simple. I reached out to a professor um, that I knew he was doing some interesting work on the evolution and population dynamics, which is the changes that happen within a population of, of animals. And he assigned me to his project. He had a project on big orange sheep in the Western Canada. And he also had a project on Eastern Greek kangaroos, of course, in Australia. Um, and I was very unlucky. Uh, he decided to put me on the kangaroo project, which was definitely the worst thing that could happen in my life. Of course, I'm joking. <laughs> so 
the picture I showed you earlier was a picture of the kangaroo population we've been working with. And that was a picture taken by Wendy King, which is a collaborator in a project. And that was taken in 2011. And this is considered a population that is at high density, which means that this population had many, many, many kangaroos in a small area. That means there's lots of vegetation, which is okay, but when the vegetation, when the vegetation goes down, that can become a big problem because there's so many of them that not all of them will be able to get enough food sources. So now if we move to this slide here, you can see that the climate and the, the landscape in the Eastern Australia is pretty amazing to see because you'll have some rivers, you'll have some grasslands, you also have small mountains as well. And all this territory is very interesting because it's subject to, um, to stochastic uh, fires, so bushfires. So sometimes every once in a while, uh, randomly, you'll have some bushfires that will start in different places in this landscape, which can be another threat to species around the, like the kangaroo. So I've mentioned that sometimes you have a big population of kangaroo that can be living in a certain environment, but uh, there's also some factors that come from the environment, like the fires that can be generated randomly, or the rainfall, or even drought, that are some things that are happening quite often in Australia, that can be a big uh, danger for kangaroos. So here, this, this is a picture of a female kangaroo. We would call her an unmarked female, which means that she doesn't have any tags or color. Uh, that female is pretty much on the field with us, and if you look behind, you can actually see that there's also another female that has a color in the back, which means this female is marked in the back, but the one in front is unmarked. And with female kangaroos, it's very interesting, and that makes them an interesting species for us Canadians to look at because they're very similar to a species we know very well, which is the deer that we have in North America. Kangaroos would be considered the Australian deer species because they fill the same ecological niche, which means that they will be feeding on the same food source and occupying the same type of territory as other um, deer species that we have in North America. So that's why we are very interested to know how kangaroos will, will behave in their natural environment because they live in an environment with so many, uh, so many disturbances that we are not necessarily used to in North America but that, is, that will probably be more often observed with climate change coming up. So females, can, female kangaroos, since they've lived in a very variable climate, which is the Australian climate, they adopted a certain strategy that is very interesting for us to look at. And this strategy is called the conservative reproductive strategy. This strategy will pr pretty much mean that the female will always prioritize her own body condition before the condition of her young. So I'm sure, as most of you know, kangaroos have uh, joeys or they, they have babies basically that will grow inside a pouch. So they, know, they, will not, they won't be like the mammal species we're, we're used to that will um, grow inside the mother's belly and then the mother will give birth and then the joey is like able to walk. Now in that situation with the kangaroos, the joey will be born very, very small, tiny, like a small bean, about five to 10 centimeters long, not even, and will grow inside the pouch. And the most amazing aspect is that they will actually grow, uh, they will actually be born super small, but they will be able to climb from the cloaca, from the opening of the female, all the way to the pouch, where it will latch on the teeth and suckle for several months. So this picture right here is an example of a young joey that is not, does not even have fur yet. This joey will be about six months and will not, in a few months, will be able to step out of the pouch for the first time. So this period, that which is called the medium pouch young stage, that's the period where the joey will start feeding on milk a bit more and become bigger, faster, which means it will cost more to the female to produce this young. Later on, the joey, if you can see here, it's uh, not the best picture, but you can see here that the joey has uh, grown a little bit and it has, oh, sorry, and it has fur now. And at that point, that joey is fully a large pouch young, which means that it comes in and out of the mother's pouch to test out its leg a little bit and be used to its natural environment. But that still means that it will feed on mother's milk. So sometimes it's pretty funny to watch because the young will flip over in the mother's pouch and drink some milk. So you'll just see its feet hanging out the pouch, hanging outside the pouch, and then it will bring back its head out. So it's pretty funny how flexible they are and how they move along, uh, move about the, in, inside the pouch. And then when it reaches the end of the large pouch young stage, when it's right about to exit the pouch, you'll see the young kangaroo start feeding on grass because they want to get used to feeding grass as well. But later on, they will reach the 
young at foot stage, which, uh, which means that they are now a young at foot. They are um, on foot, not, they will no longer go in the pouch because they became too heavy for the mother, but they still need to be very close to their mom because they still need to drink milk very often. Kangaroos will go through a long period um, of weaning, which means that they will progressively feed less and less on mother's milk and will feed a bit more on the grass available to them. But that means they still need to be very close to their mother and uh, while they feed grass, because every once in a while they'll be feeding drinking milk as well. Um, and then during the springtime, which is when we actually show up on the field and we'll take collect data and look at the kangaroos and see their behavior and capture a few of them also to measure their weight, uh, see how they're doing and, and also mark and identify them. Um, we'll see lots of males present on the study area. And if uh, you're very attentive, you can see that the males are a bit bigger, actually, you know, much bigger than the other individuals. So that we call that sexual dimorphism, which means that males are much, much bigger than females. And this is a way for the males to be a bit more attractive to females when it comes to reproduction that happens in the spring. But the males at this point, at this time of the year, while the young are very dependent of their mother and they need to drink a lot of milk, well, the males will show up and they will try to reproduce with the female and try to, to, to increase their reproductive success, which means they want to make a bit more babies every single year. So the job of a male is to be very big, to be dominant and to, to almost deter other males to hang around the same females as them. So if the males can do that, they'll have a better reproductive success. And that means also that they will spend lots of time around the same female and can actually bother young joeys that are trying to feed from their mother because they'll be bothering the females. So that makes it very interesting for us also to look at the behavior of kangaroos while we're on the field. Something very interesting also that we can see from a very young age in kangaroos is that they will feed all day, right? Kangaroos are very, they're, they're herbivores and they need to get lots of energy from the grass they eat. But the thing is that grass does not contain much energy, so they have to eat a lot of it to gain enough energy every day. So pretty much what they do all day is to feed on grass, which is pretty simple for us to observe them. And actually makes it very easy for us as well to capture them because when they're in that position, it's easy for us to walk up behind them and jab them with a, a syringe, which is the way, we, the way we capture them to be able to measure them and see how they're doing pretty much. And later on, you'll see that the young joeys I showed you earlier that were young at foot have grown, of course. They reached a sabbatical stage. And this stage is a stage that's very important for us as well because we want to understand how well they grow. And that was actually the main topic of my project. It was to understand how do joeys actually grow depending on the environmental factors, the variables that we have uh, on the field. Sometimes there's lots of rain, which means there's lots of grass and that can be a good thing for kangaroos. But sometimes there's not as much rain, not as much grass, and that can be a bad thing. And there's also the aspect of population density that I told you about earlier. When there's too many kangaroos on the study area, that means that joeys won't have enough grass to feed and that can actually uh, give them a problem and they won't grow as fast. And that's something we are very interested to understand on this uh, in kangaroos. And that can, that, can us, that can tell us a lot also about what we know about species that we have in North America as well. This is another joey that is a subadult as well. And they have, um, and, pretty, and that's the picture I use a lot because um, during a presentation I've been really, and look, personally I've been looking at how they've been surviving and growing the young uh, kangaroos. And um, that's, that's um, pretty much the most important aspect that I found on my pro during my project as a master's student was to, uh, to see that it was the juvenile survival um, before they reach uh, the subadult stage, which is this stage here, um, and also their growth. Both of these, fact these aspects were both affected by the environment surrounding them. So it was very obvious that the rainfall and the temperature or their main variables that would affect the grass available for the kangaroos. And both of these variables that affect the grass are also have an effect on the number of kangaroos present in the area later on, because when there's a loss of grass on the, uh, in the study area, that means there's gonna be lots and lots and lots of kangaroos a few years later. And that can also have a negative impact on some kangaroos that are present at a given time. Um, and now I'm gonna finish my presentation by telling you that when we're on the field in Australia, it's never really only kangaroos. We always see lots of amazing things. And I wanted to share with you one of my other passions, which is photography. And 
I wanted to show you these pictures because this, these were pretty amazing pictures that I was able to take while going on a hike um, in Australia between two field sessions. On the left side, there are, these are red um, fire ants, or not red fire ants, but uh, red bull ants, I'm sorry. And they're very big. They're about the size, about two centimeters long. And they're, they're, they, do, they give a pretty painful sting as well. So it was interesting to be able to see it from close, up close and seeing how big their mandibles were as well. And on the right side is another beetle species that was pretty amazing to look at because it was so, so tiny, but I was able to take a quick picture of it. And uh, with that, I was, uh, I didn't want to talk too much about, uh, about my study uh, species, my study project. I'm, I'm sure I'm going to get many questions about it, but I'm, I would be very happy to get to some of your questions. And, uh, and uh, if you have any questions, I'm, I'll be ready to take them now. Thank you. Fantastic, Charlie. Thank you so much. What a great overview of your career so far, your, your early career and your, your work. I think it's cool to see that, that cool hockey photo of you too, that looked like you were a, a tremendous hockey player and to hear that you've transitioned into this really amazing career in the sciences is such an interesting story. Um, as our students who are on the call sort of warm up and start to type their questions into the chat, which I'd encourage them all to do, I wanted to ask an over, overview question about um, what your typical day in the field is like from the moment you wake up, well, where do you wake up when you're in the field? Where do you sleep? What do you do all day? Um, and what would, what's the life of a, a field researcher in Wilson's Promontory like? Great question, Tim. Um, so the life of a field researcher in the Wilson's Promontory is a pretty amazing life because we do have a field station where we live. Uh, it's basically a lab that's linked to a, a housing a facility, a small house, uh, and we have running water, we have a shower, and we have bunk beds. So let's say for a field station, we are pretty com comfortable. Uh, we're about 15 minutes away from the fields, so we don't have to wake up too early. But that being said, we still wake up very early because uh, we have to wake up at dawn or even before dawn because we have to arrive on the study area at dawn. Kangaroos are known as crepuscular species, which means they're most active in the morning, so when the sun rises, and also late in the afternoon when the sun goes down. So as crepuscular species, we have to follow their behavior. We have to follow when they're most active. So we have to wake up at about 5.30 a.m. every morning, uh, eat quickly, eat breakfast, drive to the field. And in about 15 minutes, we're in the field. And then we spend about three hours in the morning on the field. Then when the kangaroos go to bed about at 9.30, 10 a.m., we go back to the study area, to the study, um, to the field station. Uh, we enter we, the data we collected on the field. So uh, GPS location, the behavioral uh, observations that we've made on the field. And after that, for the afternoon, we get ready and we leave at about uh, 3, 4 p.m., depending on the, um, on the time of the year, to be able to observe them for a few hours before it gets too dark. And at night, the most amazing part is that when kangaroos um, are done feeding, they start interacting a bit more, but that's after um, the, the, the sun goes down, which means it's dark out. Or we hear all the... the nightlife in Australia, which is pretty amazing to hear. And that's at the, the time we have to get ready to do more captures, which means that the moment we get the jab stick out with a syringe and we try to approach the kangaroos with our flashlight or with our headlights on, and we try to capture them to be able to collect more data on their size, on the, the, the reproductive, reproductive success of females, which means when the female has a joey in her pouch or not, and many other interesting aspects also that we look at. Great, thank you for that. The questions are rolling in now. Um, I am going to stop your screen share so we can see you nice and big. There you are, awesome. hello. Um, Mishmel uh, noted that from hockey to kangaroos to photography, you're very impressive. Uh, just a general compliment for you. Thank you. Um, and we have a great question from Mia and I'll come back to your question, Mishmel. Um, Mia would like to know, when you capture kangaroos to measure them, do some kangaroos try to escape? My God, great question. Mia, correct? Yes. Yes, yeah, super. Uh, Mia, that's a good question because uh, that would be a very important thing to make sure it does not happen. Uh, kangaroos, uh, of course, they have to be tranquilized because uh, they're very, they're pretty strong species. They're pretty big and strong animals. Um, and if they were to try to escape while we were in, close to them, that could be dangerous to us. And of course, when we do research, we want to make sure the animal is safe, but we also want to make sure we are safe in the process. Um, so before approaching the animal, 
uh, we will make sure it's completely sedated, completely tranquilized, which means it will be uh, lying on its side uh, peacefully. And before doing any manipulation of any kind, we would slip a piece of a pillowcase on their head so, they, so that they don't see us being too close to them because that can cause panic. Um, that being said, um, most of the time, kangaroos are very calm while we do the procedure because it's only 15 to 20 minutes uh, to measure them, to weight them, and to look at their reproductive, reproductive success as well. Uh, part of the reproductive success actually is interesting because we do look inside the pouch of the female, which is a pretty amazing thing to look at. Um, and that you, it's, hard, it's hard to imagine what it looks like, but it's pretty amazing to, to so I'm sure I'll be able to talk about it later on. But um, yeah, so the only way or the only time it could be a bit more um, likely that an individual tries to escape would be when the, we catch a, capture a female that has a young in her pouch. So sometimes we will capture mothers that have a young in their pouch, a young that's a bit older, that would be a large pouch young, as I mentioned earlier in my presentation. And these young, of course, are not tranquilized because they're too small and it would be dangerous for us to try to inject any sort of uh, product in their, in their bloodstream. But sometimes when we capture the female, we'll quickly take the large pouch young, put it in a pillowcase and put it in our, in our sweater so it stays warm while we do the measurements. Uh, but sometimes let's say if the large pouch young is very, very ag agitated, it might escape um, her, uh, a, mo a mother's pouch before we actually make it to see the kangaroo. And that can be dangerous because if the young the large pouch young goes too far, it's hard to, to find them. But it very, very rarely happens, has never happened while I was on the field. So um, it's a pretty safe procedure. We're happy it's uh, uh, we don't have too many hiccups, let's say. Yeah, it sounds exciting. <laughs> it is definitely exciting for sure. Uh, Ms. Shmuel and her students would like to know, and I think you maybe just described one of them, but she wanted to know what challenges you have when you're conducting this research. Are there any other challenges you face uh, maybe in this unique place and with this unique species? Good question. Um, I'll talk to you about a funny challenge, uh, something not too heavy. Let's say kangaroos are pretty, uh, I mean, they, they don't want, they're very wary of humans. They don't want to get too close to us and they don't like us getting too close, uh, which makes it kind of tough to do our work sometimes. And it's interesting because on the study area, there's like some sort of a gradient. Uh, let's say, since we have a visiting area for tourists to look at the kangaroos, we have many kangaroos that are very habituated to humans and it's part of the study area. But as far as you go from, um, I say, as far as you get, sorry, from this, uh, from the visiting area, the more wary the kangaroos are. And when we have to capture the kangaroos that are far from this, uh, from the visiting area, it's a bit tougher to, to actually approach them and to, to succeed in capturing them. And, but sometimes it actually works to get close to them. But there's this bird, this bird called the lapwing. It's a, you know, pretty good looking bird. Yeah, it looks like it's wearing a tuxedo all the time. But this bird is so, so annoying. Excuse me for the expression, but it's the most annoying bird simply because it will be yelling, shouting uh, at the worst possible time. Every time we'd get close to a kangaroo, it would be like the alarm system of a car would go off and then the kangaroo would be doing whatever, stop doing whatever it would be doing and would be looking around for any potential danger. So every time we'd be close to a pretty difficult thing, kangaroo to approach, these lap wings will start flying in the air and start uh, squalling all over the place, which would make my job even harder. So that's one of the challenges I would experience. Um, and that's a pretty fun one as well. Yeah. Yeah, great. Great question, Ms. Moyle. Thank you for that. And thank you students for those great questions. Um, I wanted to ask about, I'm glad you made the analogy between deer and kangaroos because when you were describing uh, the way that the kangaroos exist in this national park and people camp. It describes a lot of, uh, for all of us who live in sort of the northern part of the United States, you might wander across deer in the forest. Uh, are they really that common in this part of Australia? Are kangaroos this common? Yeah, yeah, we consider them pretty common in this part of Australia. Um, well, this can lead to actual problems because uh, the more kangaroos you have a present in the inhabited area, the more chances you have of having road kills and whatnot. But uh, since it's a national park, there's only one road and the kangaroos have lots of space to, to wander around. But you definitely have lots of kangaroos in this area. And the funny aspect is that kangaroos are not really native to this part of Australia. They were introduced uh, a few decades ago um, by, uh, I can't remember exactly what, what initiative it actually was, but there was about seven kangaroos that were introduced the first time and two kangaroos were introduced later. And this whole population that we have in the Wilson Park National Park 
which is quite substantial, was based on about a dozen of kangaroos that were introduced a few decades back. But I think compared to most other places in Australia, it's a pretty uh, high, like high number, we have pretty high numbers in the Pro National Park. Wow, interesting. Yeah. Um, what is your journey like from Montreal to southeastern Australia? What is how is how do you get there? How long does it take? What modes of transportation do you take? Yeah, good question. Um, so it's pretty classic classic mode of trans transportation to get to southeastern Australia. Thank God, it's already difficult enough on the field. But <laughs> so when we leave Montreal, uh, I of course take the plane. I usually take a connection from Montreal to the west coast of the US or west coast of Canada. So usually Vancouver or San Francisco. And then we fly out from, from uh, the west coast of uh, North America all the way to, uh, to New Zealand or all the way to Australia. So it's a very long flight, the second uh, flight. And it's a three flight process technically. It goes from Montreal to the west coast of uh, North America, then uh, from North America all the way to Australia and New Zealand. And then the last flight from uh, wherever I landed in Australia to Melbourne, which is where we actually drive uh, um, to the field. So after landing in Melbourne, we typically, typically take one day to rest from the traveling bus because it's been pretty much 30, 32 hours of flight or including the transitions, of course, but uh, the connections, but it's pretty long before getting to Australia. And once you get to, to Australia, you're very tired, of course, because there's also the jet lag. Mm -hmm. um, we are, let's say, uh, with Eastern daytime we have here in Canada, in Montreal. We're about uh, 18 hours behind uh, what we have in Australia, which is an eight hour difference pretty much, but the following day, that's uh, pretty funny to see. Let's say it's 4.30 PM right now. It would be about 8 AM in Australia currently, in the different places of Australia. Um, so yeah, we take a few, uh, we take a day or two to rest in Melbourne and uh, eat some decent food before actually driving down uh, on a four hour drive down to the Wilson Promontory National Park. And then once we're on the field, we will only uh, go about with a pickup truck. So it's not, uh, it's pretty comfortable, let's say, as a mode of transportation. That's still quite a journey. I'm sure you, oh, yeah, you stay for a little while when you get yeah. there. You don't come right back. <laughs> no, no, we a good three months at least. <laughs> Thank God. Great. Uh, we have another student question from Nadia. She is wondering um, how you deal with the birds um, since they seem to be there all the time. Have you come up with anything to sort of outsmart them? Good question. Um, I usually try to throw rocks at them. But I know I was, that's a joke, of course. I don't throw rice at birds. That would be that would be terrible. But uh, no, I, I, I that's a good question because I actually had to to find a solution to that problem because it was actually become, becoming a problem. Uh, I knew I had a number of kangaroos to capture for, to for us to get, collect data, and without the, without the data that we collect every year, it would be difficult for us to answer our, our research questions. Um, and without, of course, harming the birds, because that's not what we here, we're here for, um, I would basically have to treat the birds like other kangaroos I had to capture and avoid uh, approaching them in a way that they would uh, make them react to my presence. Uh, so it's either I, either I have to go very, very slowly and for them to see me slowly walking towards them so they can just hop away without necessarily flying away and, and, um, and being very loud. Or I would just try to avoid uh, approaching kangaroos when the birds were in the area because it would be pretty much useless. But um, yeah, I think we we have to find solutions on the field, and that's one of the aspects I really enjoyed was to take the time to find solutions to small problems that we might not think we would be facing. Right? It's not a math problem we or or a scientific problem, but just a logistics problem. I cannot get to capture this kangaroo because there's a bird that I did not even know about that is a problem. So. Great, great question, Nadia. Thank you for the great answer. Charlie, as sort of an extension on that question, I'm wondering if after the kangaroos sort of recognize you as someone who is going to try to do something to them, to tag them or capture them, uh, do they move away from you? Do they start to identify you as somebody that they don't really want to hang out with? That's a great question. And I, I would hope they would, because I mean, that would be a typical uh, evolutionary stable strategy to identify me as a predator, potentially predator and, and hop away from me if I, if, if they get used to me, but for um, really obscure reasons, this rarely happens. Um, so lots of kangaroos have, I mean, most animals can show some sort of a personality and kangaroos are no exception to it. Um, so most kangaroos that I've been able to capture one year, I was able to capture them the following year. And the same for my supervisor who's been doing that for 12 years. Um, but that being said, there's some kangaroos that are very, very wary of anything. And that's just their natural personality. 
um, but I don't, I have never really seen a difference uh, in one individual, uh, how it's been reacting to my presence at the beginning of the season compared to the end of the season or from one year to the next. But great question, honestly. Yeah, that's something that uh, we definitely thought about as well. Great. Yeah, we um, we have a couple more minutes, students. We have some great questions in the chat. I really appreciate it. Keep them coming. Oh, there's two more just popped up. I just had to say it. Uh, we've got a question from Laura. Laura is wondering, are there any kangaroos that need um, special assistance or do they need special help in any way? Or can you help individual kangaroos as a uh, part of your project? Good question. Um, I, I, I don't think we, uh, we, we often encounter kangaroos that need any sort of help. Um, and since we are cons we are coming on the field as ecologists as we're and we're studying um, really the the birth rates the death rates of the population, our main um, role is really not to interfere in the population mm -hmm. as little as we can basically because we still do interact with the kangaroos and we try to limit our interactions with them. That's why we capture them once a year. But let's say an example as an example, if I were to see, uh, actually no, I have a great example for you. There's something that's very odd that happens in kangaroos and it can only really happen in marsupials because um, as mothers will have their joey growing inside their pouch, they're not, it's not really a bubble. The joey can actually come out of the pouch and come back in the pouch of the mother. But sometimes the mother will leave the joey and let it go out of the pouch and then run away or hop away and just abandon her joey. And in that situation, we cannot really take the joey and, and try to save it or bring it back to the field station because it would be against the purpose of our research and it would go against basically the, the cycle of life because the tangles are known to abandon their joeys when they, have, um, when they don't have enough resources to, to give to their joey as an example. And that will lead us to interfere with what we're trying to observe in the population. And something else actually that I noticed that is kind of related to that Sometimes we see mothers abandoning their young. We also see mothers exchanging young. So adoption can happen between two females where the joeys will leave the pouch at the same time and enter the wrong mother's pouch. So as all the individuals are tagged and they have, uh, we have ways of identifying them, it's pretty interesting sometimes to look at a female making sure her young is in the pouch. And then, oh, well, that's, that's, all, that's all right. And then you look at your notes and you really like second guess yourself for at least two days. And then once you go back on the field and you see that, no, there's definitely a mistake. And it, I did not make the mistake. The kangaroo made the mistake. It's really amazing to look at. But of course, we cannot interfere in that sense. And of course, we let, we let things go the way they do. And, and what we do is just write articles about it and tell the world about how amazing this species is for, for what it can do. And, and of course, sometimes it's very cruel. Uh, it's, hard, it's hard to watch some of these things that happen on the field. Uh, but yeah, it, as long as we don't interfere and we don't affect them, we'll try to stay away from their life cycle. Right. Great question, Laura. That was fantastic. Um, let's go back to Nadia, who asks how common it is to find kangaroos, I guess, both in Wilson's Promontory National Park and maybe in areas around that. Do they all sort of know where the safe zone is? Good question. Um, so there's that place where we do actually most of our observations, which is called the Yanaki Airstrip. And it used to be a landing strip uh, for uh, and during the Second World, World War. Uh, so it was an emergency landing strip during the Second World War and also a training base uh, before that uh, for the Australian Army. Um, so basically this whole area is completely cleared from any trees, which is a perfect area for tank crews. It's like a meadow with low vegetation, which, which is perfect for them to feed on. So that's the main part where we see the kangaroos, but there's also an area not too far along the road that has uh, another small population of kangaroos. And sometimes these two populations will exchange kangaroos. So some individuals that are known to be in our population, they can migrate to a different population from one year to the next. And, and besides these two large populations that we see every year, um, there, we don't know if there's that many other meadows in the Wilson Promontory National Park where we can find kangaroos. And we often you know, encounter some on the road, but we, it's actually interesting because we don't really know where they live. And I wonder because you know, they're pretty, they're strong animals, can travel far distances. And I wonder, are they from the same populations we, we've been studying or are they from unknown populations that are somewhere else that we don't have access to? And that's a question I would love to answer one day that uh, we haven't gotten around answering yet. Okay. And let's say coming out actually of the national park on the way back to Canberra, as an example, 
we do see the lots of kangaroos along the road that have uh, they live in small mobs uh, uh, along the roads like near near a different farmland and and that can actually can be a problem for farmers to have uh, kangaroos uh, in this area but yeah we do see lots of them and crossing the roads and sometimes we have to be very vigilant when we drive at night because they're almost nocturnal so it's, it's sometimes it could happen that we encounter them on the road at night Okay. Yeah, Nadia, fantastic question. If anybody wants to get a final question in, now's your chance. Uh, add it to the chat. I'll ask a quick question and then I'll come back to the chat for anybody who wants to add one more. Uh, my question is, do the kangaroos have any predators in the national park? Good question. Um, they don't have uh, predators for the adult kangaroos. So they're pretty lucky in that sense because, and we are very lucky in that sense as well, because we all, we can only attribute the death of kangaroos to uh, natural causes, natural environment and uh, you know, lack of food and uh, too many kangaroos in the area. So anything like that. But there are, they have, we have a few introduced species in the Wilson Promontory National Park, uh, like the fox, the red fox, and also the wedge-tailed eagle. So what the West Chile eagle is actually not introduced. It's a native to Australia, but the red fox can be a predator for young kangaroos. So the joeys that come out in and out of the mother's pouch can sometimes be uh, uh, snagged by different foxes. But it's very rare that this happens because they're not, there's not that many of them uh, on the field. I think I've seen, I've seen a fox once in two years. Um, that their only natural predator used to be the dingo. But you may know, or you might not know. Actually, is uh, they have they built that dingo fence uh, uh, several years back because of um, the farmland, the cattle that would get eaten by dingoes uh, in Australia. And dingoes is basically the Australian wild dog species. So yeah, now there's not there's no dingoes. They've been completely eradicated from the south southeastern part of Australia, which means they don't have any natural predator per se. Okay. Well, it looks like at least for now, we've gotten to answer all the students' questions. I'm sure that as they keep reading your articles over the next six weeks and keep following your journey, that they're gonna have more questions. To close today, I wanted to ask you, what do you like the best about field work? What, what is the reason that you keep coming back to Australia and doing this kind of work? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, I, I'm sure there will be many answers I could give you, but I think, the one that comes to me the f first, it would definitely be, you know, I think we are extremely lucky to know that much about, you know, at the animal species we love and even those that we don't know a whole lot about, but being able to get actually very close to them and, and be able to look at them and try to do to better understand them, but also be able to interact with these animals. I think that's something that really keeps me going on the field. Um, and I know I'm privileged to, to, to do that because we, we want to leave these animals you know, in peace. We want to make sure they're doing well and they're okay. But there's always a few humans that have to approach them and to make sure uh, we understand how to better protect the species, help them to better manage the species. And being one of the lucky ones that can actually go in the field and explore that and, and answer these questions on the field and actually come back after that and tell stories to the world is something I'm, I feel pretty privileged about. So as if just being the, able to, to see them and to interact with them and seeing them up close in their natural environment, which is kind of a rare thing. All right, well, thank you so much for that, Charlie. That's unfortunately all the time we have for today. I wanna to thank you for sharing your passion and your work and an overview of your upcoming virtual exchange expedition with us all. Thanks also to our entire YouTube live stream audience, especially Ms. Schmuel's class and Queens. Thank you so much for being with us today and for the awesome questions. You can see our complete calendar of upcoming events at athome.reachtheworld.org. Uh, we're gonna share, if we haven't already, a direct link to Charlie's virtual exchange homepage so that you can follow his adventures in Australia and learn more about his work as those articles pop up week after week. And until then, uh, we'll see you next time. Everyone be safe and take care. Bye, Charlie, thanks. All right, thank you.